Hello, everyone. I am Bob Goulder, a contributing editor with Tax Notes. Welcome to the November edition of In the Pages, where we take a closer look at some of the recent content from our print and online publications. Our featured article for this month uh, critiques recent calls for increased entity level taxation of multinational corporations uh, at both the source and resident basis. Uh, and it does so by examining the uh, prevailing trends that have existed over the course of multiple generations. As we shall see, these, tre these trends tend to uh, play out in a sort of cyclical nature. You can perceive them repeating themselves every once in a while. Appropriately then, the title of the piece is Bitker's Pendulum and the Taxation of Multinationals. It appeared in the November 1st edition of Tax Notes and Tax Notes International. It was written by an author who will be familiar to most of you. That is Daniel N. Shaviro, Professor of Taxation at the NYU Law School. And we are delighted to have him join us for this discussion. Professor, welcome to In the Pages. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to enjoying this. Uh, so not to be confused with Foucault's pendulum, which involves <laughs> physics and the rotation of the earth, uh, your title refers to Bitker's uh, pendulum, suggesting a healthy tension uh, between two opposing forces of nature. Can you elaborate uh, on the metaphor as it relates to entity level taxation generally and um, this the push for residence-based taxation of, of, of foreign source income uh, specifically? Well, it's kind of something that I noticed uh, in my life and that then I realized, actually, I'm sort of a fan of the article by Bitker that I got the idea for this, this from. Uh, the Bitker had noticed it uh, long, actually, I, I say he, he noticed it, it before it actually happened. And that is, uh, you know, when I was growing up or when I was young, it was still the sort of post-New Deal consensus. It was kind of relatively liberal and uh, redistributive and pro-regulatory. Then the sort of Reagan era came in. When I entered law teaching, I entered in 1987, I went to the University of Chicago. And of course, the sort of Chicago heyday happened, meaning not just that that particular school, but that sort of attitude towards things. And uh, it sort of culminated for the in international. There were a lot of related things. The idea that you just cannot tax any you can really can't even really tax corporations, certainly not on a, on a source basis and probably not on a residence basis either. And uh, uh, then things kind of turned around. So, for example, without guessing what's going to happen in the U.S. Senate uh, or Congress in the next few weeks, uh, clearly there's a huge impetus for expanded taxation on both the residents and the source basis of multinationals. Of course, there's the whole OECD stuff that's going on. Uh, and uh, the, the leaders apparently agreeing to things. Uh, and it's just, it's funny how there was a standard way of thinking about it when I was early in my career that then became mocked and discredited and now it's back again, although on slightly different grounds. So it's kind of interesting. So I called, it's a pendulum like it goes back and forth and I call it Bitger's pendulum because he, uh, he kind of spotted it, it seems. So I'm curious about the frequency of these pendulum swings. They're, they're not happening all the time. It's not an annual or, or a biannual event, right? Are they, it's, it's associated with generations? Probably so. Well, I, I sort of think of uh, three waves within my experience, and then Bitker refers to the wave before that. Uh, so like the first wave was already receding by the time I entered uh, law teaching in 87. That was the sort of liberal regulatory thing. And it's manifests throughout like uh, public and private law, not just... Uh, not just international tax policy. And then this sort of what I call like the Chicago era and in, in corporate, that's kind of, uh, you can't really tax corporations on a residence or, or a source basis, you gotta do something else. And then back to the sort of back to the future, today's wave, uh, which I think was probably starting to turn, you know, even 10 years ago or so, maybe it was already starting to turn. Now uh, uh, in the biz, uh, there's a lot more respectability to things like, uh, uh, tough corporate taxes, for that matter, income taxation instead of, of consumption taxation. I wrote a piece, this isn't international, but I wrote a piece, God, how many years ago, uh, more than a decade ago, called Beyond the Pro-Consumption Tax Consensus. And I kind of asserted that uh, within kind of uh, like sophisticated tax policy circles, the income tax had been really replaced by the consumption tax pretty widely as the, the better thing. 
but that they're already could see problems with the consumption tax that I wouldn't say I quite forecast, but maybe quasi forecast would lead back towards people like the income tax. And that's of course where we are now. Still plenty, plenty of people like the consumption tax, but the income tax has much more intellectual respectability. You know, people like Sayas and Zuckman and uh, so forth talking about it, then it kind of had among economists and kind of econ fellow traveler law professors 10 years ago. So that's been the same pendulum in a way. Now, so your response makes it sound as though the the root or the, the genesis of these shifts in the pendulum uh, come from um, intellectual sources, academic thinking. But I'm just wondering is if do they need the trigger of something that is is more just like related to the electoral cycle? I'm thinking here of the, of, of the, the Trump era and uh, in 2016 and then in, in, in 2020, when you have a transition from, say, an Obama administration to a Trump administration, or you could even say from, from Trump to Biden, does that type of a shift, which isn't rooted in, 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 in an academic circle, does that become a trigger? Yeah, I think it's even broader than elections. It's kind of intellectual trends in the country, what people are talking and thinking about. When I had an early draft of the paper, I sent it because I realized I was tiptoeing into history without really being historical. I sent it to my friend Ajay Marotra at Northwestern because he's a historian. And uh, he said, uh, he suggested that I embedded a little more, as I think I did, in, in broader trends. I Obviously, the election returns matter. And for example, obviously, the Trump presidency was kind of a big shock that has uh, affected a lot of people and their thinking. But uh, more generally, things like the Enron era, the uh, the recession, the pandemic, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, how uh, well how concerned people are about distributional issues and linked with that, how well they think markets are working. Markets are working great versus markets are working horribly. And I think we've had both those views kind of prevailing more in different eras. Now, uh, one of the things I enjoyed about your article is the way you sort of uh, turn some clever phrases. Uh, m many viewers will be familiar with the concepts of the young Turk uh, and the old fogey, but uh, you, I guess, channeling Bitger, yeah, you flip those. Yeah, you flip those associations. Uh, can you explain what you're getting at there? Yeah, so this is actually Bitger's uh, joke. I hopefully have a couple of good lines I thought of myself, but this one is totally Bitger. He says that he actually attributed to, to a, a professor I had when I was a law student named Leon Lipson, who said that Yale Law School at the time, uh, 70s, I don't know, is a mixture of, uh, of, of young, of, I'm sorry, of, of young fogies and old Turks. And what he means is that there are these New Deal era guys, of course, when I say guys, 99% men and the faculty of those days, uh, uh, who are kind of like the, the heart, heart of gold and the Great Depression and markets fail and we can have, you know, and rent control is good and we should mandate health care for people from the employer and all those types of things. And then the the young fogies are sort of the law and econ people, though that won't work. You know, if you make the employer give the workers benefits, it just means they get less cash and they're not getting some value. Uh, um, efficiency is everything, et cetera. So it's, uh, so it's kind of a, a comic reversal that you have the, the young uh, fogies and the old Turks. But I guess maybe it, there's a signs of it reversing to the more normal uh, thing now. Oh, yeah, that could be. Um, another question that comes up uh, in my mind is whether this pendulum and, and the forces that cause it to, 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 to oscillate, are these global in nature or are they local in nature? And and because I spent a lot of time thinking about international taxation, and of course, we're all aware that this sort of worldwide trend going on for decades now of, 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 of countries lowering their statutory rate. And I know statutory rates aren't what really matter. It's effective rates, but still it's a barometer of what's going on, right? It's it, statutory rates aren't irrelevant, uh, but also going to territoriality. And, you know, the U.S., for better or worse, for a long time, it was a holdout, right? I mean, yeah. you've, you've seen it. There was you, you'd look at the lay of the land and there were these two countries, the United States and Japan, that had these high statutory rates while while everybody else was in some sort of a race to, to lower their rates. Yet those two countries tended to do OK. It's not like the United States and Japan are some embarrassment economically. They were some of the world's largest economies at the time. So what's your thinking on whether the pendulum swings according to global or more domestic influences? I think global trends are important. Obviously, the U.S. is both a very big country, which has a lot of market power and can 
go its own way to a degree. Uh, but also we can be insular. I think people who are interested in international tax probably less so than everyone else, but we're Americans often only listen to Americans. One thing I like about international tax, by the way, is I talk to Europeans, Asians, others, and I kind of get different perspectives and I find it very broadening for me personally because Americans really just listen to and think about Americans, but clearly there was concern about the global trends. And then and international has always been the sort of the pro-government and the pro-territory, the pro-company people. And oddly, even among reputable academics, there very often is a tendency to be kind of on one side or the other, not for everyone, but for many. And uh, so this was a cudgel for the uh, sort of pro-company to say, uh, uh, we have no choice, look at what's happening internationally. Uh, but there's still a lot of Americans who kind of think you can go alone. Uh, I was just at a conference last Friday for the greatly mourned Ed Kleinbard, and he was proposing a very tough international tax system through his, his business tax reform plan in which the US was just gonna damn well stick to residents. Uh, we're gonna tax companies on a worldwide basis and maybe make the residence rules more expansive than they are now, but uh, we can bloody well do it uh, because we have enough clout whether they're incorporated here or whether we look at management or whether we look at ownership by shareholders, ultimate, own, you know, whatever, we can do it and we can make this thing stick. Uh, so that there's still a lot of that. And it's almost uh, for both sides can almost be pretextual. You, I, I don't mean that to, I'm not insulting people's sincerity, but if you're on a certain side, you're kind of happy to be able to say, yeah, uh, either if you're on the kind of pro-business side, we have no choice. Look at the pressures we're under. We're not that strong anymore. On the other side to say, we can cooperate, we can make agreements. And so there is something pretextual only in the sense that we are all stuck. We all believe our beliefs unless we change them. And so you're looking for evidence. We all, every one of us, uh, will look for confirmatory evidence out there, <laughs> and uh, will it will mainstream it a little more readily than evidence that means you were wrong. So both sides are doing a bit of that. Next, I'd like to talk about TCJA because there's a, there's a lot there to unpack. Uh, it's not that old, just a few years uh, in existence, already acquiring a complicated legacy moved us to a territorial system sort of some would say a faux territorial system uh lowered the rate but then it it has you know the guilty in the beat as as, as base protectors um how does tcja fit into your analysis generally yeah i think it sort of starts as the the end of history side of the story this thing get rid of the corporate tax go purely territorial lower corporate rate and all that but by the time it gets enacted there's a whole lot of, uh, as you say, beat and guilty. The, the multinationals, the big powerful US multinationals did not do as well as they thought they would. And obviously they, they loved the rate cut and they were glad not to have to deal with repatriation anymore, but they got hit harder than they expected in other ways. One thing I remember, I think I wrote, I had an article in tax notes in 2017, kind of, no, 18, and I guess in 18 talking about the, the act, and uh, I might have said in that piece, I forget the, the line from Willie Loman about, you know, from uh, he's liked, but he's not well liked. These guys were liked by the uh, Republicans who were running the show in the 2017 act, but they weren't as well liked as, say, the pass throughs that they were friendly with. Uh, they don't have, you know, quote, small business, which of course we know the word small is a total misnomer, but uh, pass through business, they're big, big operators in all 435 congressional districts, pretty much, or most of them. Whereas uh, international companies, like a few years ago, people was talking to GE, obviously we don't hear as much about them anymore, but uh, they kind of didn't have uh, uh, that sort of region, regional influence commensurate with their, uh, you know, how much uh, money that, so it was sort of hard. Anyway, so the multinationals did get uh, hosed a bit relative to what they expected. I'm not saying absolutely, but compared to they thought they were going to really score big and they it turned out being disappointing. I think that reflected that the pendulum was starting to swing back. So the Republicans in Congress in 17 didn't want to uh, let all the income go to tax havens uh, and have none the companies paying a U.S. tax. They were sort of nervous about that. And yeah. of course, the job stuff, there are arguments both sides about the jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, job. Yeah, I love the Willie Loman reference because I'm a big Arthur Miller fan. Thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you've got TCJA, and it looks like we're going towards the end of history. Um, but the investment response to TCJA, it's been kind of lackluster. Is that a fair? Yeah, fair well, this is a matter. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. It's a matter of interpretation for the economists. Uh, 
there was some increase in investment. So I think, for example, Kevin Hassett would probably still try to hang his hat on that. But I think the predominant view is that there were some increases going on for other reasons, uh, such as the, uh, the st stimulative effect, that in fact that the the investment response to the act, to the lower rates, et cetera, was close to nil. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion, some of which I recount in my piece about what would explain that. So there are a bunch of different reasons for it. Uh, so, so that's pretty significant, uh, as I see it, as an observer, because uh, part of the whole logical premise behind why you do something like TCJA is growth and investment uh, and these wonderful things. And if the outcome is nil or close to nil, even in the remote vicinity of nil, that sort of undercuts the premise of why you did it in the first place. Yeah. Correct. Well, the Made in America tax plan, which I discussed in the article and which admittedly was looming larger when I wrote the article and by the time it came out, uh, was uh, very much founded. It had for a treasury, it kind of really did cite some of the literature and they're kind of a, a two of the reasons for it. One are one is that uh, for the disappointing response, they're sort of opposite explanations or they're, they could both be true. One is that companies are earning rents and where they're earning rents, they're gonna keep earning those rents and they won't be scared away for quite a while by taxes. And the other is that where they, is that uh, source is such a sham concept, you put the, that you don't really have to, you know, so the, the idea that like, oh, the US tax rate is lower, let's put a factory in the US. That's sort of like uh, 1950s economic thinking. When you have in intangibles and so forth, it's a very different world. It's not really about where you're putting a factory. Uh, I mean, it can be in a particular case, it actually would possibly affect the location of a factory. But even then, if you can just sort of have, strip out all the profits through uh, you know, royalties or interest or whatever, then it means uh, you don't care if the country lowered its tax rate because it's a more complex calculation. Your article uses this term, uh, and I hope I'm uh, paraphrasing it correctly here, Econ 101-ism. Yeah, I and, didn't invent that phrase, but it's, I yeah, like it. I like it a lot, too. Um, is it fair to say that you have sort of a, a dim view of, of the concept, or at least you see it as having a, a natural ceiling in terms of its practicality? Yeah, I would say more than natural ceiling. So, I, again, I started my academic career at the University of Chicago, and... Uh, they're, they're kind of still to this day, people who think like you draw a simple supply and demand chart on the on the blackboard and it shows you just inevitably what happens because they're perfect markets. Uh, people are rational. There are, you know, smooth, uh, smoothly rising and falling curves. Uh, and I, I think of it as a very useful uh, step to go through in your thinking. Uh, and so I'm sure there are there are actually I think there may have an earlier generation of legal scholars that not as well known to me who were pretty into markets and economics, but it had kind of gotten gotten away of it away from it. It had gotten a bit away from it. And then so you have Chicago types who would kind of make the point like uh, you can't just uh, if there's an equilibrium in a market, you can't just like throw money one side of the market. It might just shake out to the same as it was before, uh, and. So when an econ 101 ish, uh, when the sort of econ 101 is a very simple price theory would lead to a given result, it's extremely useful to uh, to say, is that right? And if not, why? You sort of have to come up with reasons. You can compare it to the Coase theorem. Like the Coase theorem is not that there are zero transaction costs, but if you're finding something that doesn't fit it, that must mean that is transaction costs. So it tells you where to look. But dogma, Econ 101-ish dogma is not something I'm fond of. Uh, there's a passage of your article where you compared sort of the industrial titans of yesteryear, the, um, uh, the, the Carnegies and Rockefellers, uh, era we generally refer to as the Gilded Age. Yeah. To, today, with the figures like Elon Musk and Zuckerberg and so forth, it, it, to create a parallel, saying that, that maybe today isn't so different, so my question to you is as follows. When you have something that feels like a gilded age, is that going to necessarily tilt the pendulum in the direction of equity concerns as opposed to efficiency concerns? Well, it creates enormous stress, but unfortunately, I don't think it's necessarily always going to be resolved the same way. Uh, back then, uh, we got the progressive era, 
and that maybe started to rent to, to sort of like the democracy fights back. Then we had the global tragedies of uh, the two world wars with the Great Depression in between, and that sort of greatly lowered uh, high end inequality, albeit at a huge cost of global destruction. Uh, but there are sort of, uh, but it could go either way. Like I think when people today are worried about, as I am, about whether the United States is headed towards fascism and towards autocracy, uh, I think this is a product of that also, and it can it can kind of go either way. So last time it was kind of resolved positively, uh, I would say at least, and this time there's no guarantee. It could go the other way instead. Uh, and then that would be, I think, a, a route towards a lot of, uh, unsettled socially unsettled you know, violence and discord and not a pretty picture but there are people but the funny thing is like 100 plus years ago people thought the danger was a left revolution uh especially probably more in europe than in the u.s but like it's gonna be like over the the iww the wobblies surely thought they were going to lead this thing that it would be a left revolution here it seems to be a right rightist violence seems to be more the danger and i wonder if uh has done this work at all, but something I've been thinking about subsequently, it has to do with race, partly. The fact in the good old days of the progressive era, uh, uh, there was utter severe, unchallenged racial injustice in this country. So this time we're kind of in better shape in one way, which is that all those issues are actually on the table. But I think one consequence of that is that it, it energizes and angers the right. So it could be that the reason they were able to achieve greater economic justice 100 plus years ago was because they were so savagely imposing racial injustice. So it'd be sort of a sad irony if the fact that racial injustice is on the table now also ends up worsening the economic. But I think the reason is because uh, uh, the sort of Trump supporter types are very upset about the, about the challenges to, to white supremacy. And this makes them want to throw in their hand with the extreme right. So a, a movement that's, you know, wholly welcome could actually end up having, I guess, uh, backlash is the phrase they used to use. The, the, the backlash is very dangerous. And then race and class sort of start to work together in strange ways. But this is well beyond my expertise as a tax person, for sure. But valuable uh, observations. Uh, you talk a lot in your article about um, Arnold Harberger. Am I pronouncing yeah. that correctly? Harberger, yeah. Congrats. Yeah. And... Um, the incidence of the corporate tax uh, in terms of the corporate sector and the non-corporate sector and the real driving debate there, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to phrase it as actually as I can, is, is the corporate tax a, a suitable mechanism for addressing progressivity concerns? And depending on where you come out on that, it could influence your thinking about what the corporate tax should look like. What's your thinking yeah. there? Yeah, so Harberger was really a... Uh, uh, he was an economist, economist, and so to him, I mentioned early in the article about how you know some law lawyers or, or legal scholars thought, oh, you know, with, uh, uh, you can tax corporations, double tax them, and it won't lead the corporate stock being less valuable than it would be if it was being taxed equally to everything else, and so on. To Harberger, it was like self-evident that uh, you couldn't tax corporate and non-corporate capital differently without it equalizing an after-tax return. Uh, so in 62, he might have, I mean, again, he's he's sort of, quote, a scientist, not a uh, not a guy on a, on a soapbox. But in 62, he seems to think that taxing capital is extremely uh, feasible. He's sort of criticizing, why just tax corporations? Uh, because then capital can leave the corporate sector and go into the non-corporate sector. Uh, but it turns out, under his assumptions, uh, which I call arbitrary, not in the sense that he picked them arbitrarily. He felt that they were empirical observations about the world, but there was sort of no general reason why they had to be so. And there are a bunch of assumptions about which businesses incorporate and about how much they use labor and so forth. It turned out that the corporate tax was borne by capital. So to him, it had the unfortunate cost of uh, driving capital from the corporate sector to the non-corporate sector, which is inefficient and wasteful. But his work kind of affirms that you actually can tax capital and redistribute that way because he had the savings rate as being inelastic. Again, <clears throat> he didn't adopt that for ideological reasons, but because that's what he saw in the data. Then 30 years later, he writes, the piece he wrote 30 years later is not by itself as uh, groundbreaking as that piece, but it shows that he's kind of uh, watching what's going on. And he says, because of capital mobility, it's completely reversed. So now labor is gonna bear the corporate income tax uh, because if you tax me too high in this country, I'll just say bye-bye, I'm going to another country. Uh, but then I think that 
the pushback after that has been the notion of rents. It's not like Amazon is going to say, sorry, we're not selling in France because you're taxing us. Uh, supposing the income tax in France was reaching Amazon, which I rather don't think it is, but uh, uh, they're not going to exit France because they're selling, they're earning rents that thought would be, and again, that's contested too, by selling to customers and they have uh, valuable IP and so forth. So oh, but that's fascinating. You have the same scholar asking more or less the same question 30 years apart, and he comes to arguably a, a different conclusion simply because you introduce the element of enhanced capital mobility. Yeah, well, it puts Harburg in a good light. It makes him look like a guy, and I think rightly so, who's kind of uh, not ideologically driven, but is uh, looking at where his understanding of the world takes him. But yes, absolutely, he reverses himself. And he doesn't say which I was wrong before. He says that the world has changed. And of course, that's quite right. Then I don't know. He's actually, uh, I think he's still alive. And the last I heard, he was still doing quite well, although not young anymore. <clears throat> I don't know if he would, whether or not he believed, it doesn't really matter at this point, uh, except you know, his friends and people who admire him, whatever many, uh, if it's reversed again. But as a matter of intellectual logic, if you believe the the new the rents story and that their location specific rents so were then the result does reverse again. Yeah. So. Uh, fascinating. It was it was uh, uh, maybe one of the highlights of, of the article was your discussion uh, of his work. Um, now you also had uh, a section where you 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 reference Humpty Dumpty, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is it's, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, it's it's like going from Aristotle to like a game show or something like that, <laughs> for, from a scholar to Humpty Dumpty. But it's 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 about the concept of source versus residence, and how much flexibility should we associate uh, with these inst instances? Yeah. You said just a while ago that 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 uh, source is something of a sham concept or that it's become a sham concept. What do we make of the artificiality that is, uh, is associated with it? Right, well, I'll just start by saying I, I, I can't, I, there are various things in the arts I love and I bring them in if I get have a chance. So another phrase I've used in international is Monty Python taxation, because there's a scene in, uh, it's actually similar in a way, there's a scene in the Monty Python skit where a silly man in a bowler hat says, most of the British economy, I tax all foreigners living abroad. And yeah, that was <laughs> from a selfish national standpoint, we're not worried about retaliation. That would be exactly the thing to do. So Humpty Dumpty, I, I've always loved the moment in in uh, Alice in Wonderland where uh, Alice said, Humpty says, there's glory for you. And Alice says, what do you mean by glory? I don't understand the word in the way you used it. He said, I, uh, and Humpty says, what I meant is there's a nice knockdown argument for you. And Alice says, I didn't know that glory means, I'm paraphrasing obviously, I didn't know that glory means a nice knockdown argument. Humpty says, when I use words, they mean exactly what I wanted to say, neither more nor less. Then Alice says, you can't, you can't do that. And Humpty says, yes, I do. I just have to pay them extra, pay the words extra. And then I think Lewis Carroll says, uh, I, we can't say how he paid them because Alice didn't ask and he didn't say anyway. So yeah, Humpty Dumpty taxation, the notion that uh, source can mean whatever you bloody well like it to mean. And I think that's true up to a point. I wrote an earlier article, I forget, I think it came out like in a Singapore Lord, Lord Journal or something like that, because I gave a talk out there. And I said that um, there sort of are two coherent source concepts that are in, in dispute. One is that the kind of source is where the production occurs, where the value is added, and the other is where the consumption occurs. And the problem is that neither one is canonically right. We kind of think of income as sort of a source, a production-ish concept, but there are plenty of rules that find source. And so it's kind of like either one could be logical, but there's no basis for choosing between them really, except that you, or rather there's no general basis. So countries have, uh, I think I, so I give these, I have an example in the thing about how I, a uh, rather counterfactual example that I sit in the US, in New York and I write books in Tagalog and I sell them in in the Philippines, yeah. nothing happens in the Philippines except that people download the books and I get paid money. So I sort of say that could be, that's absolutely New York source income based on production or sing, or Filipino income based on consumption. But it's definitely not Denmark income. It's definitely not Brazil income. Maybe we could put in some facts where there's a server there or there's an advertising agency there or something like that. But, uh, and so the kind of these two concepts uh, and to a degree, but also, I think one thing that's happened internationally, we talk things like digital service taxes, is uh, countries have been dissatisfied with uh, with how source has played out in the decades of income tax law, and uh, 
But like in the UK, if they have a digital service tax, they're saying digital service tax, they're saying the the customers are here, the market is here. Well, of course, the market, the English market for Facebook or Uber or whatever it is. Uh, that is not that is not Monty Python taxation. They're not saying we want to tax something that happened in Denmark, but they're making up their own rules that are different than the prior rules to have, to enable them to get at the fact that it's being sold in the English market. And just one other thing about that. I've kind of scoffed at uh, some people who are maybe sort of allied with me uh, in the bottom line that they kind of want to say that England and France and Denmark can tax the Facebook and other companies doing stuff there. They say, oh, it's because on Facebook you create content. So that's production going on uh, in the UK. And I just think that's the wrong way to go about it. Does that, does that mean Facebook? Well, first of all, what are the Facebook users in the UK like everyone else paid for their content? They're paid zero. What is its market value? Well, it's worth something to Facebook, but obviously to them it's worth zero uh, or rather they're able to raise zero from it. Uh, and also, but then what about like Hulu? What if, if Hulu makes a ton of money in the UK because the users, I don't know if they're even doing ratings. Does that mean that Hulu should be in a, basically a different business model because the local users of this outside created IP don't get to, aren't adding content? So I, I just think it's a country has a consumer market and a, big multinationals making money selling to that consumer market. It's not absurd for them to say, we want a piece of that, uh, whether the production occurred here or not. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a great point. There's so much there with, with, with digital service taxes. When I think of it, it OK, it's a, it's a gross receipts tax, which is a crude instrument. It's a very sloppy thing. You know, yeah. how, how much turnover a company has is an extremely poor proxy for its profitability. And if an income tax is supposed to be paid on the uh, it's supposed to be based on the ability to pay. Why in the world would any rational person uh, favor a, a, a general receipts tax? But then you think, well, wait a minute. It's because they're frustrated yeah. with 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 source and residence. I mean, if those concepts aren't working for them, you almost can't blame any of those 30, 40 countries out there with yeah. DSTs. They're, they're trying to plug the holes in their budget. They're trying to respond to democratic impulses they're trying to tax profits that they're not getting so again sloppy well, taxes but but they yeah. serve a purpose well there's nothing way shui wrote uh, an article about this that actually got me interested in the subject and he argues that the gross receipts tax character isn't so terrible in these cases because uh because there's not much marginal cost to facebook of being in the uk say well there's probably some they're kind of tailoring it or whatever but if uh if a company has no sort of uh, business expenses related to the use in a given country, then the gross becomes closer to the net. Of course, we tax, you know, passive income of outsiders on a gross basis. But again, there, there's sort of thought to be no, quite no expense. Of course, there are things like your broker fees or your, your paying interest, but uh, those are tricky things. So, but then I think of something like uh, Starbucks. So weirdly, Starbucks is a company with actual coffee shops on the ground where people go in to buy a cup of coffee. And yet in some ways it's just like Facebook and it's just like uh, 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 Google and so forth. Now, of course, if you tax Starbucks and their gross receipts in the UK, that would be a horribly bad tax instrument. Uh, but uh, I think the only income that's really produced in England from Starbucks is the, the poor schlumps who are working in the, you know, the baristas and this and the site manager, and they're not making a ton of money. So if, Starbucks makes a ton of money in the UK and they must because you kind of can't go a block in London without seeing three, seeing three at least pre, pre pandemic without seeing three Starbucks in a, in a production sense the, the, that money is created in the US uh, by the, the Starbucks team out there. Uh, but of course, in a consumption sense, it's being earned in the UK because they're selling to UK. So it's sort of uh, Ed Kleinbard wrote a piece about this too that the idea that Starbucks a bricks and mortar uh, physical goods thing could be in some ways just like Google and Facebook, other ways not, but the basically the super valuable IP and they're breaking it in there. Uh, it's, it's sort of an interesting, uh, uh, obviously, well, again, you, you can't use a digital service tax on Facebook, but in a way it's the same problem, except that you can't use gross receipts for them because it would be ludicrous. Yeah, yeah. And I think it underscores the idea that when people talk about the digital economy, you know, there are digital companies out there, but yeah. I mean, they wouldn't include Starbucks yet, as you say, it's sort of the same problem. Well, we have time for one more question, Professor. And uh, apropos of just talking about DSTs, 
Uh, my last question is about the OECD project, the inclusive framework pillars one and two, which everybody in the world has been talking about. They're at least partially viewed as a uh, response to DSTs, pillar one mostly there to try to try to get those countries to repeal uh, the DSTs. So but after reading nothing, your piece- in exchange, But not for nothing, kind of an exchange for getting getting what they weren't getting before, getting some yeah. version, uh, you know, like you, you know, Facebook, you're making a ton of money in our country and you're not paying tax to us. In fact, you're not really paying the US either. We want a shot and DST is just one way to do it, of course. Yeah. Right. Uh, so what are your thoughts on these pillars as they relate to Bitker's pendulum? Well, it's sort of the uh, the attempt at the pushback at the back to back to old debt times like the 1986 US tax act when the international stuff was very aggressive. Uh, I, I certainly don't claim to have a crystal ball about whether it'll work or not. One scenario is that it kind of works and uh, then uh, uh, there's pushback against that sort of back to the 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 prior era. But that that's a relatively benign view because it, it could also <laughs> just fail. Uh, uh, I see it as having, I, I see, I, I'm sort of pessimistic and see it as having enormous obstacles to happening, but uh, national cooperation, uh, the, raise, the, rise, the rise of very bad political regimes in some countries, but it could happen. I'm certainly rooting for it to be decently effective and to live in a world where it worked, but now it's time to move on again. That's not the worst thing that you could imagine lying in our future. So final thoughts, Equity versus efficiency, it's just a natural tension. I mean, we could come back in 20 years and somebody will still be doing a, a podcast or a video interview about what the tax system should look like, right? This is never going to go away. Yeah, well, uh, as perceptions of markets working well or poorly change, uh, as perceptions of distribution being decent or not, so you have a world where we kind of... Uh, manage to move towards greater equality and then people start to kind of feel that the fetters are too tight that you know that's one world uh another world is things just get worse and worse uh the equity side is kind of suppressed uh uh yeah it's it's uh what was the old saying uh i could predict anything except the future so as the line goes uh, wonderful. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Again, uh, it's an article well worth reading titled Bitker's Pendulum and the Taxation of Multinationals. If you have access, you can find it in the November 1st editions of Tax Notes and Tax Notes International. Uh, Professor Shavira, thank you so much for joining us on In the Pages. Thanks so much for having me. A real pleasure. Yep. Thank you. Want more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, and showrunner and video editor, Jordan Parrish. 